we can formalize the role of investment, innovation, and institutional reform in an economic model. This is what Robert Solo did. So let us look at the Solo growth model. The building blocks of a country's productive capacity, and therefore, ultimately, its level of output are the amount of capital it has, the level of its technology, and the productivity of its institutions. These are the elements that we're going to build into the economic model. The production function is a quantitative relationship between inputs and outputs. Uh, a cooking recipe is a production function. It's a mapping from quantities of inputs, a tablespoon of this, a cup of that, a pinch of the other, to the amount of food you get at the end, the amount of the meal. That is why the last line in the recipe will be serves six. So it has mapped quantities of inputs to a quantity of output. A recipe is a production function. We want to look at production functions for economies. A relationship between the amount of inputs, labor, capital, land, entrepreneurship, and the amount of GDP you get out. Since we are stuck with a two-dimensional graph, then this simplified production function is going to take as given the amount of labor and other factors and simply map changes in the amount of capital to different levels of output. So we're only changing one input here. So we have the amount of capital on the horizontal axis and the amount of output, GDP, on the vertical axis. Or, if you prefer, farm capital and amount of sugarcane. Let us say that given the amount of labor and the amount of land, one unit of capital yields six units of sugarcane and two units of capital give you eight units of sugarcane, three capital, nine sugarcane, and so on. If we, if we connect those points to get the production function, we note the shape of the production function. We note that the slope flattens as we go from left to right. And that is the manifestation of diminishing returns to capital. That is because additional equal increments of capital are adding less to output each time. In addition to the production function, we need to know how much investment is taking place under each set of conditions. And to know the amount of investment, we need to know how much people are savings, because savings is the basis of investment. Ultimately, savings and investment are equal. So let us assume that in this economy, average savings are two thirds of output. That's an unrealistically high savings rate for any country, but it makes our graph work more nicely. So out of six units of output, people are able to save two thirds of that, which is four units. And so on. Out of every possible level of output, two thirds are saved. And that gives us our savings function and therefore the amount of investment that is possible and will take place in this economy. The third component we need is how much capital depreciates at each point. 
depreciation is going to be a simple proportional relationship because the more capital you have is the more it depreciates. So whatever is the proportion, it's going to be a straight line. The more capital, the greater the repairs and maintenance and replacement that you have to engage in just to keep your capital stock constant. And with those three components, we have a model of economic growth. Let's see how it works. Suppose, picking an arbitrary starting point, we have one unit of capital. By the way, one unit of capital can be a billion dollars of capital. It can be a billion tons of capital. Or it can be, you know, one cutlass. If we have one unit of capital, our model tells us that output and therefore the real income in this economy is going to be six. And savings and investment is going to be four. But the amount of capital that depreciates is only half the amount of gross investment. The model tells us that if we start with one unit of capital in whatever units we are measuring capital, <coughs> then the amount of gross investment is greater than the amount of capital that depreciates. And if gross investment is greater than depreciation, then it means that even after depreciated capital is replaced, the economy is going to have more capital. Gross investment greater than depreciation means the capital stock is growing. Let us say it grows from one to two. Then we repeat the exercise. If capital grows from one to two, then output grows from six to eight. Savings and investment are higher. Depreciation is higher. But in gross investment is still greater than depreciation. So the capital stock will continue to grow. Indeed, as long as that savings and investment curve is higher than the depreciation curve, the capital stock keeps growing. And therefore, capital does stop growing until those two curves cross. What that means is that as capital grows, two things are happening. One is that capital is experiencing diminishing returns. It is adding less and less to output each time, and therefore less and less to savings, and therefore less and less to gross investment. So gross investment is growing, but at a smaller rate. But depreciation is growing proportionately. More capital, the more you know, replacement and repairs. So at some point, the capital stock is large enough that all of gross investment is used up by replacement and repairs. And so the capital stock stops growing. And this is the models and therefore the economy's steady state. That capital stock is steady at three and output is stagnant at the level shown.
This is the Solo growth model. Due to Robert Solo, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for this in 1987. Now that we have the model, let us see if we can look at the effect of innovation, of adopting more productive technologies, and how it shows up on our model. And innovation, the application of a more productive technology, means you are getting more output from the same inputs. So for the same amount of labor, same amount of land, and this existing stock of capital, you get more output. So that is an upward vertical shift of the production function. And if the production function shifts upwards, the amount of output you are getting, and savings is a constant fraction of output, and savings and investment also shift upwards. So this is the manifestation as of, if you have more output, then you're able to save more and gross investment goes up. And if gross investment was previously equal to capital depreciation, and now there's more gross investment, then it means that the additional gross investment above the amount of capital depreciation can now start adding to the capital stock again. So the innovation causes the capital stock to start growing until it gets back to the point where gross investment is now equal to depreciation again at a higher level of the capital stock. And the economy gets to another steady state there. And output there. We can show that innovation has two distinct effects on the economy. The economy has grown for two distinct reasons as a result of the innovation. There is the direct effect. Output goes up because you're getting more out of the existing amount of inputs, including the capital stock. And there is the indirect effect, which is the induced growth of the capital stock that comes from being able to save and invest more. So economies that are able to show continuous economic growth, it is because there is continuous innovation of new technologies. By way of an example, and of an institutional constraint on savings and investment, Crime and violence and general insecurity in a lot of developing countries holds back the rate of innovation and investment. The solar growth model captures for us both the limitations of capital investment alone, as well as the importance of continuous technological innovation.